I just want to welcome everyone to tonight's presentation with members of the Amamutsin Land Trust, Lawrence Atencio and Marcella Luna. And Marcella is also a member of the Amamutsin Tribal Band. And I'm going to hand things over to Lawrence and Marcella in a moment, but first allow me to just introduce Myself, my name is Marisa Gomez and I am the public programs manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. And we are proud to offer this program as part of our series, CZU and You, which is in partnership with Santa Cruz Public Libraries. It's a month long series. And uh, tonight's event kicks off the month of programs, which are all meant to support our community as we remember the events of last year's CZU lightning complex fires in the Santa Cruz mountains. And events will include online presentations as well as programs in nature and cover a variety of topics meant to support your recovery efforts, preparedness for the current and future fire season, and uh, deepen ecological understanding among our community when it comes to fire in our region. Um, so while we won't be able to see uh, or hear your voices uh, for tonight's program, we still wanna hear from you in our own way, the way that we can in this webinar setting. Um, so again, please take a moment to adjust who you're sending your messages to from, I guess they changed it to host, and I'm not sure how what the default is anymore, but change it to the one that includes um, everyone, basically. Um, and go ahead and respond to this prompt using the chat. Share some benefits that we receive from fire. So while last year's fires were traumatic and destructive and just an all around negative experience for so many people. Fire also provides many services to us. So I thought we could start by reflecting on uh, what some of those services might be. And if things do come to mind for you, please share them in the chat. And if you send them to everyone, we can all uh, hear from each other and hear each other's perspectives. Uh, and we hope that you will continue to communicate with us and each other via the chat as the program continues. And we will have time at the end to reflect upon what you've shared as a group and address any questions you may have. And we started off tonight by acknowledging the indigenous communities whose homelands we all occupy. And I wanna share that the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History resides in the traditional and unceded territory of the Yupi tribe of the Awaswas Nation. And today these lands are stewarded by the Amamutsin Tribal Band who are working hard to fulfill their obligation to creator, to care for and steward mother earth and all living things through relearning efforts and the Amamutsin Land Trust. And we're gonna be learning about um, the Land Trust's efforts to um, restore uh, landscapes using fire and fire relationships in the Santa Cruz mountains and beyond tonight. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and welcome in our speakers. They're going to be on the same screen um, because they are together in the same yurt, <laughs> as you can tell. Um, so I'm going to be handing things over to our speakers, Lawrence Atencio, who is the field manager for the Amamutsin Land Trust's Native Stewardship Corps. And then we're also going to be hearing from Marcella Luna, um, who is a certified wildland firefighter, Native Stewardship Corps member, and also Amamutsin tribal member who sits on tribal council. Um, so thank you both so much for sharing with us tonight and um, why don't you take it away. And Lawrence, you're still muted. I'm not sure if you're trying to, you're all, your face is all in darkness, so it's hard to tell. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you, uh, Marissa, for the, for the introduction. Uh, Santa Cruz um, Museum for having this event and to all participants to join us this evening. And um, I'm Lord Tentio, the um, field manager for the Amalmutsin Native Stewart Corps. And I'm joined this evening by Honorable Councilwoman Marcella Luna. Thank you for having us this evening. I'm grateful to be here. My name is Marcella Luna. Native steward for the Amamutsu Land Trust Native Stewardship Corps. We'd like to demonstrate off with the um, kind of a use of a quick fire in showing how we utilize it on a daily today, which is by a smudging or a prayer in a quick way of uh, giving respect and honor to Creator, you know, all the forces, spirits, and we utilize the smoke as a messenger to carry up you know, for 
blessed the day and continue blessings and may we, that we do things, everything from our heart and recognizing our ancestors, their past, their culture, their values, uh, and a way to uh, allow us to reconnect with them and do the best that we can wherever we may go. So. <clears throat> so with me is a bundle of um, sage, I believe maybe I've collected at the local um, Arboretum here, uh, University of Santa Cruz, which we have a good uh, connection with. But with respect to one um, creator, we look, look for you today. Thank you for blessing us with the rising of the sun, the beautiful ocean, the wind, the birds, all wildlife that have been resilient through these times, the fire, COVID. Uh, may you watch, continue to watch over us, bless our families, uh, continue to help us learn and steward Mother Earth as, new, as needed. And we thank you for this day, for this opportunity to share our cultural traditional values with those participating in this call and more that will follow up later with the provided link. And thank you all. We have a blessed evening after this conclusion of this presentation. Thank you. Oh. And I pre pre prepared a PowerPoint uh, demonstration or a PowerPoint presentation here. I'll try and go my best as far as um, taking my time to go through it. And please take notes if there's any questions that arise at the end, there's time for that as well. Is that showing good, Marissa? Thumbs up. It's still loading on my end. I'm not sure if that's <laughs> me or, or what I'm seeing. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's looking great. Thank you. So this is the title of the um, presentation and kind of the overall and take home message as the Amalmuts and Phil fit and many indigenous native tribes feel that a fire is a sacred and we'll get into a little bit more of the um, significance of fire here. Oops, uh, this slide went in the wrong spot. So, so fire is a sacred gift given to us from creator and should be treated in that way. And that's a quote from Chairman Valentin Lopez. And he spreads or speaks and reflects on at the majority of his own talks, presentations, and that lightning, I'm not sure if you all heard, but that just goes to show that Creator provided this valuable resource. And maybe at one time before man was on earth, it was a means of allowing these ecological processes to take place so that native plant communities, you know, could become a little bit more resilient for fire, but also that fire is needed for their maintenance and strengthening of these uh, plants and the services that they provide, not just for the plants themselves, maybe they're more productive for wildlife and uh, providing um, the secondary, um, what we say, um, products that we derive and depend upon from plants. So I have here, fire is a natural force that serves a critical role in the ecosystem Everything creator provided on earth is interconnected and works together as a community. Fire serves as a, which is a very critical, important component. So we view this as an overall cyclic or what we call like, um, kind of like a, look at a bicycle wheel and all the spokes on that wheel. 
they're all needed to serve a role. So we use fire sacredly as demonstrated earlier with the prayer and smudging, uh, giving respect to our creator to be able to use this special gift. And again, it's through ceremony, fire is a sacred spirit that is given respect and welcome. So prior to majority through any indigenous tribe, fire is always invited in and it's a, um, it's a living, living spirit that you're able to bring in to your home, to your ceremonial grounds, uh, should you be isolated out in the mountains. And if you have that respect for fire, you're not alone, it be there with you at all times. Uh, fire produces smoke, again, which carries our prayers, cleanses, and is also, or could be used as a visible signal. So when I say cleanses, it also does this when done out on the landscape and that it will kind of aid in the elimination of pests, let's say uh, ticks and uh, you know other, um, other issues we have out there that where fire is needed to kind of aid in their presence or their control and also provides warmth that's as we all know. I like to say the warmth and um, I'm from New Mexico and in northern New Mexico majority of the people there depend upon the burning of wood for heating their homes for cooking whereas here I feel that's why there's such a increased amount of uh, fuel is due to that non, you know, you're sort of stewarding the land yourself when you're going out and harvesting wood on a year to year basis. And as here, um, uh, wood is not consumed in such a way. Uh, of course, uh, fire allows us to cook and it provides a light. And today fire, is vital in land management as a resource management tool to restore native rangeland, such as the California coastal grassland prairie. And um, this, of course, as you guys may know, has was once one of the most biodiverse plant rangeland types. Uh, this next slide kind of goes back more into um, traditional value and beliefs. And as a first people, we believe creator placed us here to take care of our mother earth and believe that it is our obligation in life. All other traditional practices, all of our traditional pr practices revolve around our relationship with all that is living and therefore is sacred. It is important that we re revitalize the sacredness to Mother Earth so she may begin to heal. And restoration efforts must include local indigenous knowledge and traditional practices which involve fire. So similar to your uh, assignment earlier to say where you're from and recognizing the territory of the indigenous tribes that are there or once were there is uh, important in giving that respect towards them and seeking um, their input as far as uh, their traditional knowledge of stewarding Mother Earth. And, you know, that's critical in the work we do. That's what we're striving to incorporate, let's say, into state park lands and or BLM lands now. And we've been part of SoCal Fire Demonstration as well, which we'll get into. The next is a quote I got, you know, I found it very interesting. Um, it was off, I think, a Bay Nature Magazine article. And it says, people have become disconnected with the land and fire and they've kind of forgotten or perhaps because this has been a generational assault on who we are, perhaps they never knew who we were or who we're meant to be. So, this kind of connects to traditional knowledge of these local tribes not being incorporated, let's say into an adjacent um, larger 
land management agency, rather, whether it be like the US Forest Service or Brewer Land Management and or um, other government agencies or state parks or it's, we believe that we have the best uh, values, knowledge when it comes to um, caring for Mother Earth. However, we are not accepted as so in let's say the educational um, written research aspect, but that's something we're hoping to um, change through partnerships, through working with universities and educating our youth and gaining experience. However, when this goes into um, that decade of um, where natives were, were forced upon missions, taken away from their um, traditional valuing and day-to-day -day practices of mothering earth, there was this period that was forgotten as far as how these lands were once managed and what they provided and how they were functioning. This slide here is sort of a view and if you put yourself you know, way back before our European contact and how these uh, land, lands must have looked, which we refer to as a historic uh, plant community, uh, you know, these were dominated by um, native coastal prairie grassland, which has vastly changed throughout time due to the lack of fire. And back then, you know, sadly to say, um, many species have been lost or extinct or at the verge of it. And you think of, um, first thing that came to mind when I thought of uh, coastal prairie grassland was tule elk. And now they're kind of limited to preserves, and they also serve a function in the maintenance, let's say, of this uh, grassland, along with other um, maybe bears as well. So just things for you to think of through. So how did we get to where we're at today? And you looked at that pristine kind of coastal prairie grassland. So back in 1778, a uh, fire was banned and no longer allowed uh, maybe for you to burn your property or ranch um, area or you know, homesteaded area. And then we have an uh, introduction of non-native plants. Majority of them of that, at that time were viewed for forage value for, for, um, your, for livestock that was also brought in. Then of course, with uh, coastal prairie grassland is the key um, rich resource value of the soil. So that soils are very high, in, have high productivity of the molissosol type. And you get a lot of uh, agricultural lands, as you know, abutting all the way to almost the ocean itself. And then of course, urbanization and continued um, growth and we have climate change, which is ever being more and more studied and more revealing. And uh, we have these woody um, species now that are becoming more adaptive to the changing climate and are encroaching upon, you know, what was once an historic open grassland uh, range type. Then with the increase of the woody vegetation, a species that we treat uh, for example, is Douglas fir. So you have this huge patch of Douglas fir, even age class, and it has this huge, um, just there's nothing else but this dog, dog fir kind of blocking, um, let's say, precipitation from hitting the forest floor, sunlight, and therefore you have a really low or no diversity underneath. It's just litter and duff and no diversity of grasses or forbs under which was historically there. Thereafter you have this um, hazardous fuel loads, this um without cyclic use of fire, you're just getting an accumulation of um of hazardous fuels. And then of course we have um insect and disease. So without the use of fire or prescribed burning, which is you know controlled burns at low intensity, 
we're seeing what we saw just you know last year, which was the um, large CZU complex and many other fires throughout the state and the, throughout the whole West. So these are um, growing as far as I was seeing the most extreme fire behavior as far as um, the spread, rapid spread of these um, fires. And when this occurs and you have multiple fires, you kind of stretch out your um, resources that are available that might be able to take care of a, maybe a small acreage fire, which now is interconnecting with other fires, creating these uh, mega fires. And um, so there's, however, through this presentation and the presentations to come, uh, also there's opportunity to now consider taking care first of where you live and becoming firewise and uh, looking at the uh, density of vegetation, the type of vegetation you have, their spacing so that you're prepared in the future. And now with that fire went through, it also reduced a lot of the heavier fuels or flashy fuels and there's opportunity to maybe do prescribed burns around where you live. And you may want to um, follow up with your local prescribed burn association where you may live as well. So here is a photo of the uh, native Stuart Corps and uh, maybe we participated there's overall, but yeah, so thank you. Um this is a picture of the stewardship corps and state parks, which we are grateful to be in partnership with, as well as Cal Fire. We currently have um, six senior stewards who are fire trained and four new stewards who are excited to be fire trained very soon. And including our awesome field manager or supervisor Lawrence as well, who's fire trained. Um, we are grateful to be in partnership with state parks and Cal Fire, like I said. And um, we also very much enjoy participating in the, the fire training, which is with Yorok Treks, Klamath Treks, Tel Sahara, and local Bay Area fire trainings as well. Um, great programs, great people, and we just love participating in that, you know, when the time comes. Um, and um, we are working hard to bear, build our fire program for the Amamutsu Land Trust. And we learn, we're, and um, we're continuing to learn how our ancestors stewarded the lands and we're grateful for that. Thank you. Yes, uh, as Marcella mentioned, we are um, building our fire program. The overall goal of the Amamutsu Land Trust is to allow tribal members to gain uh, gain this uh, knowledge and put it into practice. And the Native Stewart Corps is a kind of a, the means of doing so. But it's also um, building our working relationships. Let's say this photo here is with uh, some of the state parks crew out at Año Nuevo at our um, more um, cult, at our more known or um, I guess larger project of the Calosta Valley Cultural Preserve. We just received an uh, extension on a grant to continue stewarding there for maybe another seven years or so. And what we're doing out there is treating, again, like Douglas fir, just this dense Douglas fir stand that wasn't historically there. And we're trying to give the native plants that were once there a chance. And that's through, um, we'll follow, we'll follow the following slides will show kind of the processing that occurs. Something we didn't get a chance to include in this is also the um, plant propagation project. Uh, we have a greenhouse out at um, Pi Ranch for Pi Ranch lease property by Cascade Ranch. And we have where all the plants in there are native uh, collected from this area and uh, will be uh, right now currently plugs, but the seeds from that will be dispersed out at our project site. And um, well, this is a kind of just a quick, um, I mean, a, a quick view of a kind of a, a Doug fur. Right. Yeah, 
Yeah, explain a little bit more stuff. Yes. Um, so this is our tree felling of the Doug Fir and Quito Ste Valley Cultural Preserve. And before we fell the tree, we do it, we give an offering to the tree. Um, it is our relative. We'll offer tobacco in a prayer, giving thanks for the tree's life, um, acknowledging and um, thanking our ancestors and letting the tree know we come in a good way. We don't come to harm. Um, the duck fur is our target species, you know, encroaching on the native grasses um, and redu reducing the duck fur. We'll be able to restore our coastal prairie, re reduce the fuel. And, and our goal is to broadcast burn also. Yeah. Cool. If you didn't all see that, that's actually Marcella. Let's watch that again. <laughs> yeah, so the stewards do also obtain, um, as you see, Sawyer training. And um, so that this work is done in a safe manner. Um, it, it's a, yeah, it's a high risk uh, job. However, uh, Marcelo also is our safety and materials uh, steward. So she makes sure we're all outfitted with the proper uh, protective equipment, which is important for anyone uh, working in this line of work. And also that they know the proper procedures of felling a tree. And that's where I come into play. And Marcelo as well, as far as uh, we all steward each other, watching each other. I run uh, the Native Steward Corps as a fire crew as well. So here's some more Marcella can share more on. So after we fell our tree, we create a burn pile. Um, and then uh, once our tree is felled, we process our tree or bucket up or limit. And um, we address um, a designated area to create our burn pile typically not in the grassland area, but close to our felled tree. We strategically create our burn pile, um, normally about six feet by six feet by six. Um, and we'll space our piles about five to 10 feet. That way when we light our tree, our piles, they don't light together and we, let, we control our burn and, and um, also we let our piles um, dry to, so that when it's time permits and when we get a good burn window, we're able to, to, to burn them safely and they burn smooth. And in, in the pictures, we have Natalie Garcia and Lupe Delgado, native stewards. And also our summer interns also help us in the summertime, about four to six weeks every summer, that they're out helping us as well, create these piles and, and learn along with this as well. So next is uh, another video, and this is of the actual burning of the piles down at a uh, Coroste Valley Cultural Preserve uh, this last um, fall. And it was unique for me to be part of this project in that I finally, I got to be part of the get-go as, or haven't seen a project move so fast from the actual fouling to the piling to the burning. So we're actually, really removing these fuels within a year, which I thought was you know, pretty remarkable. Also the first time state parks kind of exceeded burning of 200 piles. And so her. And Lawrence, I just want to share that the videos aren't um, playing quite right, but if you want to reshare your screen um, and press, there's a little button for optimizing for video, if you want to try to do that, they're like kind of just lagging. Got it. Well, maybe at the end of the, or you could, maybe I'll be more visible and they could watch uh, after the presentation. So, 
the Native Spirit Corps, we were also fortunate to be part of SoCal Fire Demonstration Project. They've been in the planning phase for maybe you know, four years, and we were part of the uh, first initial implementation of that plan, which is preparation of a 22-acre sulfur spring um, prescribed burn. And this prescribed burn on this, when it, when it occurs, will be a broadcast burn. What you see here, there's a video, but as you mentioned, they're not showing as should. Maybe it's this option. I'm not sure what I did here, but yeah, so now we're seeing a box that's like your settings that needs to be closed. It might be that it's like you shared your whole desktop instead of the window. If you want one thing we could try is you could just like um, press stop share. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. I think we lost, we lost them for a second. It might be that it was actually an internet issue. So I'm going to wait for them to come back in. Um, everybody, thanks for your patience. Um, Lawrence had an issue with his internet at his home. So he went to go join Marcella. And they're at Pie Ranch. I don't know if you all have um, have heard of Pie Ranch. It's up near Anya Nuevo and uh, the Amamuts and have a partnership with them. And they're able to stay and like camp at Pie Ranch. Um, and then they also have a garden plot there um, where they have wellness ceremonies too. So I believe that's where they both are right now. And they um, are in a yurt. Um, and so I think that they just are having some issues, <laughs> but um, I am hoping that they're going to join back in in a moment. Um, and in the meantime, maybe I can share um, some more about our program series just so you guys can see what else, um, uh, what other options we have for you um, coming up for the CZU and U month. Um, so I will. Go ahead and share my screen. Um, please pardon all my tabs. <laughs> um, so these are the events that uh, the museum has that we're we're hosting that we're putting on. Um, and then Santa Cruz Public Libraries has also spearheaded some other events too. Um, but uh, we have several walks that have filled, <laughs> unfortunately, but we're gonna continue offering walks within the burn zone in months to come too. So just um, sign up for our newsletter and you'll be notified about that. And then um, this event is for museum members and we're gonna be learning about, we've been talking about state parks already, um, but we're gonna be learning about how uh, state parks responded to the fires because they had a lot of parks impacted and how um, the evacuation process went and what, they're, what they've been up to since. Um, and then on the anniversary of the lightning storms, we're gonna learn about the science behind that weather phenomena um, and what we might if, uh, expect in the future. Um, and one of our favorite places to visit is the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve, which I think a lot of people in our community don't know about, um, but it's a wonderful sand hills habitat. And Jody McGraw has done a lot of work um, studying the sand hills and conserving the sand hills. And we're gonna learn about um, her work and this reserve in particular, which actually burned in 2008 during the Martin fire. And then it burned again during the CZU lightning complex fires. Um, let me see if we've gotten, yeah, we got Lawrence back, sorry. I will stop sharing this and I'm gonna share a link um, with you all uh, after tonight's program too. Hi, Lawrence. <laughs> Hi, do you, do you recall which um, slide I left off on? Uh, mm, well, we were trying to watch a video. <laughs> after, okay, no, no, I got you. Yeah, were you? Oh, sorry, you kept talking, not realizing we had lost you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that happens. 
sorry about that. But no worries. And yeah, maybe when you share screen this time, if you want to press that button, it says um, optimize for video and then like share sound. Those are two check marks. Got it. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> Thanks for your patience, everyone. Everyone's being really good and staying put. <laughs> All right, here. Oh. Great. All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. Now with this optimize option, let's sell it in action one more time. much going on. <laughs> We're almost there. We can see the back of house side right now. There we go. And it looks like we've got to skip forward. <laughs> well, not, it's not really going as <laughs> we had hoped. But, uh, that's okay yeah it's i think it's like all catching up right now we're kind of like slowly getting through all the slides so maybe we just have to like let it okay well i'll focus <laughs> it. it sounds like some fun stuff's happening <laughs> Can you um you see this slide clear now? Um so we're it's still kind of been like going little by little. So now it says NSC crew participating in SoCal Fire Demonstration Project. Yes, we're good. And I won't do any more of the videos and okay. <laughs> there was a video with this. I'll just explain what's going on here. That sounds great. So we were um we're grateful to be part of the SoCal Fire Demonstration Project. And they've been in the planning for about four years with the uh, what's referred to here in California, the CEQA process. Again, I'm from New Mexico. I used to do the NEPA process, which I guess is similar, just specific to the state of California. Anyhow, what this um, planning is to do broadcast burning. So what you seen earlier was the burning of piles and that and ideally broadcast burning is sort of a more landscape of benefit burn in the long run that, that it benefits you know all um, resources and kind of continues throughout a landscape here however is the preparation part and probably the most um what i would say uh, what we refer to as ground and pound work is the um, construction of a fire hand line and the prescriptions for so cal fire demonstration was a six foot hand line we did maybe a mile of and up a pretty steep uh, slope, which is a uh, very physical demanding, but it's great experience. And um, I've utilized this in the past for um, flanking a fire to um, prevent it from, you know, continuing on to a, or to stop its spread. So it's one of the main tools used in fire suppression. Um, maybe before we get here. I had one slide that got out of place and this is it. And Lawrence, I, I might recommend just um, stop 
like stop sharing screen one more time and then reshare because it's um, looking kind of fuzzy. Um, I think something went went amok when. Um, I'll try that right down for you. Yeah. <laughs> It's all right, we got time. <laughs> all right. I think it's the videos, they have too much, um, yeah. like a lot of space. So here's a, a slide here that was out of place. I wanted it towards the end. And this is taking in, um, oh, no. <laughs> hmm. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, this the screen share appears to have stopped again. Okay, so here's a, Ideally, what we would like to get towards or building towards is the use of cultural burning. So this cultural burning uh, perspective is to target a, a native plant community. So I derived these um, points from our chairman, uh, Mr. Valentin, what Lopez and his knowledge of what he learned from his um, my earlier generations that was passed down to him. So um, he's talking about fire here. And um, but after, let's say, our first burn of a fire, which we just had throughout here, you get a good um, seed production the following year, which again, you know, all the birds and animals then greatly impacted now that the CZU fires went, they kind of had to seek for, you know, shelter and uh, additional resources. I was living in Davenport and noticed an increase in wildlife around where I lived in birds, turkeys, and uh, mountain lions. So seeds were also important for ancestors for a food that was a food source and that's being known or revealed throughout a lot of the archeological sites. Uh, the second year after the second year, so you burn one year, maybe in the fall and it's a cooler temperature, has a lot more, um, I guess lower speed and um, rate of growth because of the um, maybe the uh, temperature um, and also um, maybe so timing is critical as far as the window and opportunity to have a successful kind of low intensity burn. Um, the second year, so it says there was more a for these native plants and getting a um, kind of reproductive um, shoots um, going and providing for valuable feed for browsing animals such as deer and elk. So the third year after a burn um, or the third time that you burn an area, you sort of get more, um, it says bushy plants that were also an important food source. So maybe let's talk about brush here. So also important for medicine plants and because plants are still young and pliable they were good for basketry traps and cordage so at the time you know those are critical needed for the gathering let's say of these seeds or fruits berries and there's a lot of resource at that time out here available um, so then the more you burn, this is going on, let's say to the fourth year of a burn, uh, the plants start getting bigger and bigger and then uh, they're able to use them. It's just for boats, bowls and and housing. So um, it's important, I guess, that fire when it is um, periodically done and done at the right time with the right conditions, it provides for a more um, healthier um, and fire resilient of native plant community and a lot of these native plants they are adaptive and they are uh, dependent upon fire and the uh, fire does a lot more than just the burning through of it also you know aids in uh, the soil the nutrients and carbon and nitrogen fixation so um, a lot of benefits to, uh, with the fire and um, not just with the elimination of uh, hazard fuels
And Lawrence, I'm just going to interrupt you one more time. <laughs> and then we're going to just uh, uh, put it to rest. Um, the slides are still appearing kind of fuzzy. So um, someone just suggested that perhaps if you stop sharing your screen one more time <laughs> and then maybe like unchecked those boxes that we checked for video, that maybe that might fix it so that we can better read okay. the text. Thank you. <laughs> And another thing that we were just chatting about in the chat is maybe we could get a copy of your slides so that we can share them um, over email sure. afterwards too, so people can go back and read on their own time. It's a it's a big file, but we'll do. <laughs> yeah, and it's probably because of the videos. Yeah. Dang. I'm just trying to get to the last slide here, and that's <laughs> going to open up we're almost the there. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> Hopefully in the future, we can hang out with um, you guys out in nature and not have to deal with technology and learn um, learn from you in some of the places sure. you work at. I, yeah, the Corosa Valley Cultural Preserve is sort of a, what we're looking towards. Um, not just hosting like say trek fire trainings but educating public as well and always best as you are saying see out on the ground itself i kind of just froze up on me here <laughs> well you said you only had one more slide it's, it's darn if it's just one more slide then i'm sure people would be okay with you verbally sharing what it would entail. <laughs> All right, um, I bet you I just, I could just pull up. The... There we go. There we go. So sorry about this technical difficulties. We are operating at Pi Ranch out of a yurt and um, the internet service ain't all great, but we're working through it. So I tied up this smoke signals. Just I don't know if any of you guys watched the movie Smoke Signals, but <laughs> it's a good movie. Look it up. Um, so some kind of take home points here is um, again that fire is sacred and it is a gift, you know, from creator and and should be uh, respected when used. And what I mean by that is not abused or you know, there'll be an arsonist out there and try and think that you're doing something good without, uh, you know, proper training and or notification that say we have prescribed burn association or, you know, it's an opportunity now to be involved with them. And also with us, um, that's ideally what this presentation is for, is to um, build this uh, partnership and working relationship. Uh, so our ancestors utilize fire as a resource tool to steward Mother Earth, and we must too. So that's sort of what we're here to do. Um, the Native Steward Corps is a means of reconnecting with our ancestral traditional values, practices, and beliefs. Uh, currently, we are participating in pres prescribed pile burning to reduce the heavy fuel loading with anticipation of doing cultural burning, which are broadcast burns of low intensity across the landscape that will benefit, promote, and create a resilient native plant community that is fire adaptive. So what we're saying there is having a native plant community that is now resilient, not just to, I guess, more towards non-natives. And one thing we're seeing with our pile burns, and maybe just recently we went out and we must have drugged over maybe 2,000, let's say, on bull thistles. So there's this amount of um, invasive species within the, within the seed bank. So, um, you know, it's um, something that, that it's just, uh, I guess when you look at plant succession and the disturbance and what's in that soil and what will come up and we really want to promote native species. Therefore, now we have the plant propagation project. The crew today just went out and we're treating, uh, let's say another invasive which is coyote brush, which is very difficult to burn the best means of treating this coyote brush is through a mechanical of uh, just trying to grub it out. 
uh, knock it back and give our native uh, plant uh, opportunity to um, grow, either reestablish by seed or plug, and then uh, giving it that space and sunlight and moisture to, uh, to do its thing. Um, through our efforts, we aim to educate and encourage indigenous knowledge of native stewardship that can be incorporated into long-term uh, management plans. So uh, what I mean by that is uh, working closely with state parks. Uh, we're, we'll be partnering soon with the uh, Barua Land Management. We're being incorporated or through that with a memorandum of understanding and a uh, place like SoCal Fire Demonstration Project as well. So we have future projects upcoming at Henry Coe. And um, yeah, so we're building in it, um, ourselves as far as experience and um, ideally our crew will grow as well. And uh, we welcome you out at any time to, um, you know, would you like to learn more? There's our website, there's some contact information and uh, we would welcome, you know, some educational field tours if uh, that. We also have um, volunteer days open with at Pi Ranch and our plant propagation project as well. And uh, I'll turn it over now to Marcella with any uh, closing words and then we'll go into questions thereafter. Or they're not even on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you for this opportunity. And um, thank you to the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, all the participants today. Um, yeah, and um, like Lauren said, it'd be great to have public out with us, learning along with us as well. And, um, and fire is sacred and it heals Mother Earth, manages the landscapes, renews all relationships, opens the waterways, protects, and um, um, we, we look to fire to have ceremony and, you know, we believe our prayers go up in the smoke and you know, we are grateful to our ancestors and creator and each other. Thank you. So with that, um, let's well open up to some questions and answers and stop sharing my screen here. Great. Thank you both so much for that. And I, um, I'm i sorry that we couldn't see your videos, um, but still so much um, covered and we're grateful for, uh, for all the work that you both do through the Land Trust. We did have a couple of questions come through um, that I will relay to you. One person's curious about coyote brush. You've been talking about coyote brush as something that you're trying to deal with, but they're wondering um, yep. if it's native or not native and why, if it's native, you might um, be trying to target it. If you could um, kind of go into that a little bit more. Sure. It I believe it is native, however, similar to um, Douglas fir, it's now, let's say, encroaching and growing, expanding further into, let's say, another native plant community, which will be the coastal prairie grasslands. A good example is um, up at on Año Nuevo and it's White House Canyon Road, but right across is a field. If you look to the right, there's a lot of the coyote brush, but to the left, it's um, broadcast burn yearly. And you could see the change just drastically with the reduction of coyote brush. So ideally that's where we want to get towards the prescribed um, broadcast burns, but yet we have to reduce those heavier fuels first in order to um, do the um, more controlled landscape approach. Right. and. The, the thought behind that too, right, is that fire used to be a more um, constant part of this landscape and that people have actually been introducing fire for millennia. And that's the whole reason why we have these grassland communities, why we have coastal prairie. And if it weren't for that, we wouldn't have it and these species wouldn't be around. And so it kind of requires this attention in order for us to be able to help these coastal prairies. Um, which is great. And, and then someone else is um, curious about Pi Ranch. So yes, it is Pi Ranch, um, Layla. And uh, maybe you wanna share just a little bit more about your relationship with Pi Ranch? Sure, great partners. Um, they And it's really built off their recognition of the coastal tribes that you know occupied this 
area and they welcome us. Um, and it's due to we lost our where our um, ranch or headquarters being a Cascade Ranch. So that area burned uh, the old historic. What's the name of the house? Do you remember the house name? Yeah, the ranch we were staying. Well, there's, there's the historic home is still present. Or had a little damage to the um, maybe like the porch area, what have you. However, it's deemed um, you know unsafe to um, stay there. We still use it as storage, however, and uh, therefore uh, Pi Ranch opened up uh, their arms for us to allow us to to not just uh, reside here, but we also do um, some project work for them as well. We've done some thinning of the eucalyptus stand that's pretty dense here, and also um, along the riparian corridor. And now uh, they're looking um, towards us as far as um, including some native um, plants to uh, introduce or to reintroduce and put out here. You know, I get, they have a um, native garden here that's open to public and will tell you the value, traditional values of those plants. So great place to visit. I'm sure you guys already have, but we're here. If you guys want to <laughs> come out and meet some of the native students. Just yeah, and one of your somebody. monthly volunteer days is at Pi Ranch too, right? So people can register to come work with you in the native plant garden. That's correct. Cool. Yeah, I'll send a link um, in our follow-up email too so people can connect with you that way. Um, and yeah, you, you were actually, you were all working during the CZU lightning complex fires, right? Like didn't the, the native stewards have to evacuate? Yes, we had to evacuate. And, um... Some were a little traumatized by that because, um, you know, it's a beautiful place we were staying and the fires were approaching and it's just that uncertainty and and where I am in the southwest where I'm from fires a lot more, you know, uh, has been there throughout our livelihoods or accustomed to wildland fires, whereas I saw the stewards here, maybe their first time at a just anything out, it doesn't hit home till it hits home, then it's, mm -hmm. you know, something you'll never forget. And I myself was residing in Davenport and that brings up a good point in that there was little um, communication and or what we will have in place is the incident command system, which would have better prepared everyone and um, been more informed. And however we take it as what's done is done is now a learning um, thereafter and there's opportunity to um, participate with your local prescribed burn associations, get involved and um, let's uh, be better prepared uh, yeah. down the line. That's really great advice. And I'll, I'll try to find links um, to those resources as well to share with people. I, I think that's great. Um, some other questions have come in. So Kari is asking, um, do you know if uh, the Amamutsun ancestors did cultural burning in chaparral plant communities? Mostly as I've, mostly I've heard about fire in relation to coastal prairie communities. I believe I will say so because that chaparral type and their ancestral territory will be more towards like pinnacles, right? And again, I'm not a mom myself. I'm uh, from Okeowinga in New Mexico, but uh, Marcelo, I just might have a little bit more on that, but we believe so because um, the archeological studies that are being um, found, you know, there's always been some fire or maybe carbon dating that would uh, reveal that fire was, utilized to manage those lands. Um, some other questions that have come in, one from John, in urban areas where burning native veg along creeks may not be possible, how can we simulate same values using targeted pruning on species like elderberry and coyote brush? How frequently might these woody species have been burned historically? So thinking of riparian areas in particular. Yeah, but you can still burn, but maybe you're thinking more of um, not not a broadcast burn, but a pile burn, as you saw in one of the footage. So, you know, the piles we had there was a fairly large uh, size. You can still uh, trim kind of, uh, you know, the base of the tree. And what's what's uh, what you're harvesting from that is could be in a much more smaller controlled um, burn pile and not so close to say to the water itself, maybe an area spot. You might have to walk that fuel a little bit further to burn in a safe remote area, but it can be done. 
just might take a little bit more effort. But what ideally you want to do is just remove the density of uh, kind of that dead and down material first. And I, I guess I'd be able to provide more if I were to visit the site or shared some photos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think this is from the same person, John. How frequently might the area included in the CZU burn have been managed with fire in the past? That's a good question. Uh, um, this is based upon terrain, obviously, and um, what that what that terrain provided resource-wise, and uh, there would be nuts or you know harvesting. Um, or let's say anything from willows used for basketry. So it's really based upon um, what the need is for and how frequent it should be burned. Um, you know, like elderberry patches come to mind. So anywhere from I'd say periodically yearly, like on a, on a grassland type of a community when you're talking a little bit higher up in the, like in the Santa Cruz mountain, those drainages anywhere from like maybe three to five years more out than um, regularly yeah yeah and i say this has come up a lot in our programs that we've been having with the museum um in the wake of the fires and it does seem to me like um the jury's still out a little bit on fire frequency in say a redwood forest versus fire frequency in chaparral versus fire frequency in grasslands yeah. um and so it's you know there is there there isn't like a you know definitive answer but it does seem to me based on what i've learned from um, from our speakers is that grasslands frequent, <laughs> redwood forest yes. less frequent. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think of grasslands and you look at that growing point, you know, it's at the base at the bottom and, and when done at the appropriate time when those grasses are dormant, that's ideal to um, burn because that plant will still be protected and then come spring it should, you know, taking the, what the beneficial nutrients of the fire provider. And then um, kind of on this topic from Taylor, does fire play a role in the health of redwood forests? Of course, you know, a lot of the native, any native uh, species is fire adaptive and dependent upon. So you know, that will aid in the encroachment of all um, these maybe tan oak or other species that may um, pose or threaten or um, encroach upon a redwood forest. Yeah, and as um, I'm sure many of you joining us tonight know, redwood trees are adapted to be able to withstand fire, which is an adaptation that um, surely comes from experience <laughs> um, generationally, uh, having fire be a part of that habitat. And um, during, I was kind of mentioning earlier, some of the other programs we're going to have in our series. And um, among them, in particular, when we go to the Bonnie June Ecological Reserve, and when we hear from Jody McGraw during her online presentation, we're going to learn about um, several species that are definitely fire adapted. And like the only reason why they're here is um, because fire has been, you know, a constant presence in this landscape for, um, for generations. Um, so lots to, lots to continue digging into, and we're, we're now past seven, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time, and uh, just again share that I'll be sharing a, a follow-up email, there will be a link to the recording, we'll see what we can do about getting Lawrence's slides to share, um, I'll also share links for upcoming events and then other resources for you to continue digging um, into these topics, and uh, we hope to see you at future events, and Marcella, thank you so much um, for sharing your insights and experiences. And Lawrence, thank you. And we look forward to uh, to hopefully partnering with you, you both for future future presentations. Great. Great. Thank, thank you. you all. So much. Thank you. Good night, everyone.